Okay, and let's continue. Again, my name is Boaz Golani. I'm a professor of industrial engineering and management at the Technion. And in the last five years, I'm also serving as the Technion vice president for external relations and resource development. It is my honor and pleasure to open the first public lecture event of the International Space University 2016. Those of you that have attended the opening ceremony last evening have heard from our president that the Technion has an active space program since 1984. We have already launched two satellites and we plan to launch a group of three microsatellites next year. Space research was a prime area of competition, tension and rivalry during the height of the Cold War as the USA and USSR were engaged in a race that started with the Soviets taking the lead with the Sputnik and then the Americans holding the upper hand since the mid the Apollo series to perestroika and the fall of the Berlin Wall. Space research has become a prime example of international collaboration. American, Russian and other astronauts are spending time together in the international space shift freedom and numerous other collaborations are happening all over the world. As such, the Israeli Space Agency engages in close collaboration with the Italian and French space agencies on developing joint satellites and the Technion has signed a memorandum of understanding with the University of Waterloo in Ontario, Canada to launch a joint quantum satellite in about three years. This satellite will contain a quantum processor capable of some quantum computation tasks and will be connected to two ground stations, one here in Haifa and the other one in Waterloo, which will send and receive quantum communications. I call on the participants of the ISU 2016 who came here from as many as 24 countries to follow the path of international collaboration. We all share one planet, which is a tiny little fraction of the endless space around us. Even if we pull all our resources together, they may be dwarfed by the challenges which space research places in front of us. So surely, if we split and go at it separately, we only hurt our chances to achieve real progress. Our distinguished speaker today, Jeff Hoffman, is a NASA astronaut and a professor in a university that is very close and dear to us, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Looking at his career at NASA, I noticed the unique role he played as both an astronomer and a repair person of the Hubble telescope. Dr. Hoffman thus serves as a particularly important role model for our faculty and students here at the Technion, where we always strive to develop both science and technology. During the coming weeks, we will hold 12 open events of the ISU with leading scientists and astronauts that come to Israel especially for this purpose. I invite you all to follow the information provided on these events in the ISU 2016 website and the Technion website and pre-register. The next open lecture will be given on Sunday by John Lodgson from George Washington University who will tell us about the U.S. race to the moon, a topic that has attracted my imagination as a teenager growing up here in Israel in the 1960s and ever since. I wish to thank again all our sponsors, particularly the Adelis Foundation in Israel and the Toronto Technology Transfer Fund who have contributed so generously to this event. And now, without further ado, I call upon Dr. Hoffman to the stage and I look forward to hear your lecture and wish all of you a most enriching learning experience here at the ISU 2016. Thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Golani. Uh, while I'm giving my introductory remarks, I'll put this up so that if any of you want to copy down the information so that you can uh, keep track of all of the other very interesting events that will be going on during the next months, uh, here it is. Uh, 
it, it truly is a great pleasure to be uh, back in Haifa. I, I say back in Haifa. I first came here as a young student in 1962, way before most of you were ever born. Uh, and the city has changed a lot, uh, in most cases for the better. Um, and I've been back several times since. So, um, this is my first uh, serious visit to the Technion, however, and, and I've been incredibly impressed both by the uh, external facilities. I also was privileged uh, to have a tour through the Asher Space Research Institute, uh, courtesy of, of uh, Professor Gurfil today, and was extremely impressed by the absolutely world-class level of the research that, that's going on here. Um, as they say, it's always a question, is uh, the Technion the MIT of Israel, or is MIT the Technion of Cambridge, Massachusetts? But in any case, we share uh, a common um, desire to push the limits and, uh, and uh, really explore space and develop the technology that will really allow us to uh, move forward. So with that as background, of course, the, the subject tonight is the Hubble Space Telescope. I'm not going to tell this as a suspense story, okay? I mean, the title was, What Went Wrong with the Telescope and How Did We Fix It? But you all know that we did fix it. And in fact, the telescope, uh, the Hubble Telescope has gone on to be one of NASA's possibly the most productive scientific mission, uh, in large part because of our ability to, you'll see, firsthand. Um, we have a, a wide audience here in terms of your backgrounds. I know a lot of people are technically advanced, some people are not, and so my talk will be addressed to both people. Uh, it's important to start when we talk about the Hubble Space Telescope. This was a multi-billion dollar project. It's expensive to put anything into space. Uh, and a very complex, delicate instrument like Hubble in particular. So why go to the trouble? I mean, we can build telescopes on the ground. So just briefly, uh, it's important if we're going to tell the story of Hubble to understand why go to the trouble of putting it above the Earth's atmosphere, which you can see here? And of course, the reason is that when we look through the atmosphere, we lose various things. First of all, the atmosphere is constantly moving around, and so the images of stars also move around. Now, astronomers, very clever people, have figured out how to eliminate a lot of this uh, distortion, but nevertheless, uh, you can get the sharpest picture if you go above the atmosphere. Also, uh, when you look at the Earth at night, uh, there is a halo, a, a night glow of our atmosphere. And when you want to look at very faint objects, faraway galaxies, you want to have as dark a sky as possible. And going above the atmosphere, it's darker than it is anywhere, even in the darkest desert or mountaintop. And finally, of course, the atmosphere absorbs a lot of the electromagnetic spectrum, the ultraviolet and the infrared, which Hubble is sensitive to, and which carries a lot of useful information for astronomers. So for these three reasons, we want to go above the atmosphere, because the dream of the Hubble telescope by far-looking people like the astronomer Lyman Spitzer and some of his colleagues, even before the dawn of the space age, realized that if we could put a large, optically perfect telescope above the atmosphere, we would have unprecedented view of the heavens, of faraway galaxies. And of course, the fainter the objects you can look at, the farther away you can see. And because light travels with the speed of light, that means we can see objects that came where the light came from earlier in the history of the universe. So we would be building not only a telescope, but a time machine. This was the dream of Hubble. But it didn't stop there. We have, before Hubble, 
we had put smaller telescopes in orbit. But like any satellite, once you put something in orbit, with the exception of, of Hubble, uh, what you put up there was what you were stuck with. If something broke, well, maybe you had some redundancy. If so, OK. Uh, but more important, uh, when you look at telescopes on the ground, uh, the Pal famous Palomar telescope, you start with a large mirror. That mirror, once you've made it, is good for decades. But the instrumentation that we put at the focus of that mirror is constantly improving. It's sort of like Moore's law of computer memory. You know, the number of CCD uh, chips that you can get in a certain area is constantly uh, improving. But with a satellite, whatever instrument you put up, that's what you were stuck with for the lifetime of the satellite. Well, the Hubble Space Telescope, of course, was designed in the 1970s. Uh, and the instrumentation that first went up was already almost 20 years old when Hubble was finally put in orbit in 1990. The dream of Hubble was that you would be able, through visits by astronauts working in spacesuits from the space shuttle, to remove old instruments and replace the continent. The large deviation from being completely smooth, only be a few centimeters. That's how smooth it had to be. We were able to make a mirror like that. Uh, the resolution that that would give us um, uh, if some of you are not in resolution, just bear with me. There's a lot of cool space stuff coming up as well, so I'll try to keep everybody happy. But I know we have a lot of technical people in the audience, and, and that's part of the Hubble story, because, of course, uh, as we know, for, for a given diameter, um, the actual resolution that you can achieve depends on the wavelength, and this is the wavelength that Hubble was operating in, the ultraviolet, visible, the near-infrared. Uh, and it was capable of, in principle, resolutions better than a tenth of a second of arc. That's, that is phenomenal. Uh, how do you actually make a large mirror? Well, the Hubble telescope was essentially the space version of the best telescope technology. Uh, the mirror, very similar to the way the Palomar mirror was made. You start with a big piece of glass, and you gradually polish it, and you take more glass out of the center than out of the outside so that the mirror ends up being slightly curved. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Um, again, I'm getting a little bit technical, but if you have a perfectly spherical mirror, that's the easiest kind of a mirror to make. When amateur astronomers in the old days used to polish their mirrors, and you would always start by making a spherical mirror. But the problem if a mirror, if the surface of a mirror is spherical, the light rays which hit the outside of the mirror are not focused at the same place as the light rays that hit the inside of the mirror. And so you can never get a sharp focus. This is called spherical aberration. Actually getting ahead of myself, because this is exactly what happened. If the mirror were slightly too flat and you took a little bit too much glass out of the outside, you would also have spherical aberration and you would not get a proper focus. And we'll see what happened. Just as a brief review, this is the way the telescope works. It's a Ruchi Chrétien optics. The light comes in, bounces off the, that primary mirror, which has a hole in the middle, is reflected, bounces off a secondary mirror through the hole, and it's focused behind the primary mirror. And this is where you put all of the detecting instruments. This is a, a larger view. So behind here, you have all of these detecting instruments. The actual 
focused beam of light uh, is about this big in diameter. And each of those instruments has a little mirror which you basically stick into that focused beam and bounce the light into the instrument in different directions. So the, the focused beam of Hubble is shared by essentially four, uh, five, six different observing instruments plus some star trackers. So it's quite complex. In fact, Hubble as a whole was incredibly complex. Um, the precision with which it had to be made, uh, the optics, the fact that it was designed to be serviced, all of these things were pushing the state of the art and as often happens in space technology, when you're pushing the state of the art, sometimes you can't e exactly estimate how much things are going to cost or how long it's going to take. And sure enough, uh, people don't remember this now, but there was an awful lot of criticism of the Hubble project before it was ever launched because it was over budget, it was behind schedule, but NASA persevered and finally in the spring of 1990 Hubble was put into orbit. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of publicity. Uh, actually it was very gratifying to NASA, to the astronomical community. Uh, the public media picked up on it. There were lots of articles about the incredible discoveries that Hubble would be able to make, how it would revolutionize astronomy. The public reacted very favorably. There was a lot of expectation of what this great telescope would do. As I say, this is not a suspense story because you all know what happened. When What's the first thing you do when you pick up a pair of binoculars? Well, you hold it to your eyes and you take the focus ring and you sort of go back and forth and you try to find the sweet spot in the middle where everything is in proper focus. And that's what you do with a new telescope. Well, to their horror, the astronomers at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, which were they're responsible for operating Hubble on NASA's behalf, found that the best they could do was this, the out of focus. Hubble could not focus properly. This is a picture of a galaxy, but when you look at an individual star, instead of seeing just a point of light, you saw this pattern uh, which really looked to optical experts like spherical aberration. How could this have happened? It was an incredible, it was a disaster. And again, you know that story had a happy ending. And because it had a happy ending and Hubble has gone on to be so successful, many people, particularly younger people who didn't live through that time, don't remember what a disaster it was for NASA, for the astronomical community. Um, just one example, I mean, the Hubble telescope was the subject of jokes of late night comedians. It was denounced on the halls of the US Congress as a techno turkey. Uh, NASA at the time was trying to convince Congress that uh, they should start funding what would become the International Space Station. Well, as you can imagine, NASA was not very popular in Congress and the basic message was, go do something about Hubble and talk to us about a space station. So, in order to fix a problem, first you have to understand what causes a problem. And that was the first order of business. How did this happen? What, what actually is the problem? Again, a, a technical diagram, but uh, this is the radius with, in which you would like the light from the telescope to fall. And the original design was that within a tenth of an arc second, you would get just about 90% of the light concentrated in this very small area, whereas in fact, the measured performance of Hubble when it was put into space, you were getting, well, 90%, you, you were out at one arc second, which doesn't seem like a lot, but it was a terrible disaster from Hubble's point of view. So, how did it happen? <clears throat> when you are actually forming a mirror and you're grinding away the glass, 
you have to have some way of measuring the shape of the mirror while you're doing it so that you know that you're going to get to the right shape. Astronomers have learned how to measure the shape of mirrors. The easiest shape to measure is a spherical shape. You can do certain types of interference tests. I'm not an optical engineer. I, I can't go into great details. But you get these interferograms, and if you have a proper, properly formed uh, shape, you'll get these nice straight lines. As I explained before, though, Hubble's mirror could not be spherical because you would get spherical aberration. It was an aspherical mirror. So how do you measure the shape when you have all of these tests designed for, that, that work best for a spherical mirror? Well, what you do is when you're making the measurements, you introduce another instrument, almost like a, a little telescope. It's called a null corrector. And what it does, it sits on top of the primary mirror. And what this essentially does, it optically transforms an aspherical optical mirror into a spherical mirror that you can measure. So it's called a, a null corrector. In this case, it's a reflective null corrector. Now, in order for this correction to work properly, the, this corrector these corrective optics have to be put at exactly the right position with respect to the focus of the primary mirror. In order to do that, you have a measuring rod, and that has to be very accurately positioned. So in order to make sure that that measuring rod was properly positioned, it was designed, this is the top of the measuring rod. They put a little cap on top of it. And inside, there was a hole in the center of that cap. And the idea is you would install that measuring rod. Then you'd shine a light, a laser, down through the little hole. It would bounce back. You can measure very precisely the distance. This is a picture of that measuring rod. And this is how it was installed. Fairly complex, not easy to get at once it's installed. The people who designed this system recognized the fact that it might be possible to install it incorrectly. So in order to make sure that the position was properly measured, what they were concerned about was that you know, perhaps the laser would bounce off the top of that uh, end cap rather than going through and actually bouncing off the top of that measuring rod. So in order to prevent that, they put an anti-reflective coating on top of the end cap so that the only light that would be reflected would be from the top of that measuring rod. Well, they located the uh, technician at Perkin Elmer, the company in Connecticut where the mirror was made. And the first thing they found from him was, well, you know, I had a lot of trouble putting that measuring rod in. It didn't seem to fit right, and I had to put three shims in. Now, that should have been a red flag, but nobody had really, I guess, explained to him how critical this was. He, they just said, install it. And so he did his best, and he put these little shims in. And then they measured it, and sure enough, it was at the right position. They found the measuring rod. It was stored off in a closet somewhere. And they found the end cap. And look what they found. Some of that anti-reflective coating, which is on most of that, had actually chipped off. So that just what everybody had feared might happen, in fact, did happen. And some of the light actually bounced off this part rather than going through the hole. And the result was, instead of this, which is what they wanted, the position was down here. And that whole measuring rod was out of place by a little over one millimeter, which doesn't seem like a whole lot. But when you're dealing with this kind of precision in the optics, it makes a huge difference. Just again, to remind you, uh, what had happened. Uh, and the result was that the mirror 
was actually made slightly too flat. In other words, a little too much glass was removed from the outside of the mirror. How much? About one micron. That's one millionth of a meter. A typical human hair is about 50 microns. So the Hubble mirror was out of shape by 1 50th the diameter of a human hair, which doesn't seem like a whole lot. But given the precision of Hubble optics, that made all the difference. So having established this trail of errors, you, the, what they then did was they, they made a computer program to say, well, all right, if we misplace the measuring rod by 1.3 millimeters, what would the focus look like? And the computer simulation looked, as you can see, very similar to the actual images. So it was pretty clear that we now understood what happened to Hubble. I've actually found many, even a lot of astronomers, everybody knows that Hubble has problems and they know that the mirror was too flat, but very few people actually know the whole story. It's a real object lesson because, in fact, there were some other tests done. They removed the refractive null corrector uh, and used some other instruments to measure the shape of the mirror. And in retrospect, when they went back and looked at some of these uh, readings, they found that they're wicked. Anyway, that's an important lesson. There's a lot of interesting sociology that, that went on as to why this was not discovered. Uh, there were also reasons why they didn't perform a, a total end-to-end -end test of Hubble, which I I don't really have time to go into. But in any case, now that we understood what the problem was, how are we going to fix it? So again, here is a diagram of the optics of the telescope. There were all sorts of ideas. Uh, put a, uh, a, a donut-shaped balloon around the outside of the primary mirror and inflate it to bend the mirror. I don't know about that. Uh, not too easy to do in space, and especially to get the precision. Remove the secondary mirror and put in another secondary mirror with a slightly different form. That would have worked, but there was no way for astronauts in spacesuits to access the mirror. Um, bring the telescope back and fix it on the ground. We actually had a second mirror was made by the Kodak company, which is sitting in a warehouse somewhere. It's probably a perfect mirror. But the fear was that, first of all, the telescope would get totally contaminated, and the expense and everything, it might never be launched again. So they really wanted a way to fix it in orbit. Some optical engineers uh, came up with a very clever solution. And here's the essence in kind of in a block diagram. This is the out-of-focus beam that comes in. Remember I explained that every instrument has a little pick-off mirror, which normally would get the light and then send it into the instrument. So what we'll do, we'll take another mirror, two mirrors actually, one of them will block the out-of-focus light, reflect it off a second mirror, which is slightly curved to compensate for the lack of curvature of the main mirror. Each of these mirrors would be about the size of your thumbnail. Uh, and then you would send that into the instrument. Now, it, it, the optics are a lot more complicated than I'm showing here, but this is the essence of the solution. Now, if your uh, Hubble, as I explained, was designed so that you can remove old instruments and replace them with new instruments, and in fact, the fir there was a servicing mission which had always been planned for the end of 1993, about three and a half years after Hubble was in space, because the uh, the primary observing instrument, the Wide Field Planetary Camera, um, it turned out it was not performing well in the ultraviolet. It had been contaminated by, uh, probably by organic contaminants. We had a second Wide Field Camera, and the idea was that the servicing mission would install this. Well, now, of course, we had a real crisis on our hands, but since we had this instrument on the ground, the corrective optics were built into it, and so we were just basically able to install this instrument with the corrective optics built in. This is a picture of me holding 
that uh, new field planetary camera and we put it in. But there were four other observing instruments inside Hubble which we didn't have replacements for. How were we going to fix those? Well, again, a very clever work on the part of optical and mechanical engineers. Most of the instruments, uh, other than the planetary camera, were installed inside these big boxes. Um, looked about the size and shape of an old-fashioned telephone booth, the kind that you can actually get into. We don't have too many of those anymore. And the idea was we could have all of the other corrective mirrors. They would be stowed inside this package, and then we could remove one of the instruments from Hubble. We would have to sacrifice that, put in this corrective optics package, and once it was inside the telescope, then all of these mirrors would be deployed, sort of like a big umbrella skeleton, so to speak. And of course, they had to be positioned to a fraction of a millimeter. So it was an incredibly complex task, both for the optical and the mechanical engineers. This is a, a diagram of uh, just one of those mirrors. All of, all of it, as I said, had to be folded up and, and uh, Eventually, uh, it, was, uh, it was designed, tested, uh, and we really felt at that point that, number one, we understood what the problem was, and we actually had a solution to fix it. So now the big question for all of us in the astronaut office, and now I'll start to get a little more personal, who's going to get to fix it? And as you can imagine this was considered a prime assignment for anybody in the office. It was such a critical mission that NASA was going to do everything in, in its power to reduce the risk of failure. So one of the decisions that was made, only people who had previously done a spacewalk could be assigned. Well, here's where sometimes luck plays a role in people's careers. I'm going to go back now with a little bit of my personal history into my first space flight, which was in 1985. This is the crew. Gosh, I look young in that picture. Uh, it was the radiation, by the way. That's what makes my hair fall out, so I can blame it on that. Um, but the, the, the basic purpose of, of this mission, it was one of the early shuttle flights, and in those days, mostly we were uh, launching satellites, and uh, we had two satellites, the first one of which went off without any problem. The second one was a Navy telecommunications satellite, had a motor on the bottom to take it from shuttle orbit up to geostationary. About two minutes after it was launched, a little omnidirectional antenna on the top was supposed to pop up, which we had seen happen, you know, 50 times in the simulators. And we were looking out the window, and after about five minutes, it occurred to us, you know, nothing's happened. The satellite was dead. Well, they had us move away from it because 45 minutes after deployment, if everything had worked right, the engines would have fired, and you don't want to be nearby when that happens. Uh, but nothing happened. Big Tiger team gets together. Is there any single point failure? that could cause this. It turns out there is a little switch on the outside of the satellite. When that satellite is inside the shuttle, that switch is depressed um, for safety reasons. You don't want, and the, the motors can't fire if that switch is depressed. You do not want the motors to fire when the, sh when the satellite is inside the shuttle, right? That would be a bad day. Possibly the micro switches underneath this external switch hadn't activated right, so is there any way that we could actually go out and wiggle that switch? That was really the only, we didn't have any specialized equipment on board. Is there, that was the only thing that they could come up with. So we went into a, what was originally a four-day flight. They extended by three days. Um, it was one of those Apollo 13 things where they throw all the equipment that we have on board on the table and say, all right, make some tool that they can use to wiggle that switch. So, you know, we were cutting and pasting and sawing. And, of course, 
as one of the two crewmen who had been trained to use a spacesuit, because on every shuttle flight, two people were trained in this, even though we weren't planning to do a spacesuit, when we first heard the word EVA, oh my God, you know, this is incredible. We couldn't believe it. Um, people asked me, was I, was I scared? Yeah, I was scared they were going to change their minds and we wouldn't get to go outside, but luckily they didn't. And so, sure enough, uh, we went outside and we attached those uh, tools. They, they came to look like fly swatters, so some of you may understand why we became known as the SWAT team. Uh, and sure enough, we actually went up and wiggled the switch. And I had my Spacewalkers union card. And so, luckily, I was eligible for assignment to the Hubble rescue mission, together with six colleagues, of whom uh, Kathy Thornton, Tom Akers, and Story Musgrave were the other three spacewalkers. We were planning an unprecedented five spacewalks in one mission. We didn't just have the optical problems. There were a whole bunch of other problems that had developed with Hubble, which I'll talk to you about shortly. So with five spacewalks, they felt that was too much for just two people to go out five days in a row. So we had two teams. Story and I went out on days one, three, and five. Uh, Tom and Kathy went out on days two and four. So we were a, we were a happy crew, but uh, also a very busy crew because, uh, as you can imagine, the, the training is very intense for the uh, remote manipulator arm operator, a, a lot of training on robotic systems. And for those of us doing spacewalks, we spend about 400 hours underwater. Uh, we do most of our EVA training underwater. EVA, of course, extravehicular activity spacewalks. The reason being, uh, a fully loaded space suit has a mass of on the order of about 120 kilos. If I were wearing a spacesuit here, uh, I, well, I wouldn't be able to stand up. I certainly wouldn't be able to move around and do anything useful. But underwater, the spacesuit is filled with air. It wants to float, and so they put lead weights on your chest, on your arms, and legs to make you neutrally buoyant, so you don't rise, you don't float. And it's remarkably similar to actually being in space. I remember during my that first spacewalk, I, I had been trained in a lot of underwater uh, work. And as I floated out of the airlock over to the tool chest to get the tools to attach those fly swatters, uh, I remember I was looking down towards the floor of the shuttle and I remember thinking to myself, you know, this feels awfully like it, what it did in the water. That was really good training. Then of course I turned around and there was the earth and the sky and I'm not in the water tank anymore. But, as I say, we spent about 400 hours because we had five spacewalks, each of which would last about seven hours, although our first one ended up even longer because of some problems, which I'll, I'll mention later. Um, we couldn't afford to waste time, so we really had to rehearse and rehearse and make our every move as efficient as possible. You don't want to go up to Hubble and get up, get in your foot restrained and get ready to work and find out that you don't have the right tool with you. Then you have to go back 20 minutes to the airlock, get something else. You just can't afford that time. We also introduced for the first time the use of virtual reality as a training tool, which is now a standard tool for, for training for uh, space missions. And we really, we treated this almost like choreography. We wanted to be able to position ourselves at just the right place so we had the best control because, you know, these are, are very delicate optics and, and you don't want to break anything or, or get anything out of alignment when you're installing it. But uh, eventually the training is over. We get in our NASA training jets, fly down to Cape Canaveral in Florida. The night before launch is always exciting. They light up the shuttle and we, we go for the night viewing. Uh, it's a, just a remarkable sight. You're looking up at this big, beautiful white vehicle and, and knowing that you know, at four o'clock in the morning, that's what we were doing. Um, a lot of my friends complain, why in the world do you have to launch at four o'clock in the morning? Couldn't you do, they didn't understand orbital mechanics, ISU students. You better understand by the 
takes you through uh, some of the actual mission. So first of all, of course, all the spacesuits are packed up very tightly. They're stowed in the airlock, which normally was designed just to hold two spacesuits, but we had four in there, so it was pretty crowded. A lot of the delicate equipment, of course, you have a lot of launch vibrations, so you have to protect it. Um, and so it's all packed in, in big foam boxes. Tools, absolutely critical for spacewalking. You know, we have big, uh, we check the backpacks. This is, uh, they have carbon dioxide scrubbers, uh, batteries. On the day of a spacewalk, I get up early in the morning, have a big breakfast, because I know I'm not going to get anything to eat for the next eight hours or so. We, we do have water, a drink bag in the space, uh, space suit. Um, you can see radiation monitors on me. We have radiation monitors as well as heart monitors. Uh, the thermal environment in orbit is quite extreme. When it's nighttime and you're on the far side of the Earth, uh, particularly if you're pointed away from the Earth, it gets very cold. You're radiating into space at uh, 3 degrees Kelvin. And so we wear a layer of uh, thermal underwear, sort of like when you, if you go skiing, all made of fireproof Nomex, because the atmosphere in a spacesuit is pure oxygen, and so fire protection is, is very critical. But when you're in the sun, it can get very hot. And so the second set of long underwear is uh, filled with tubes, uh, you know, a few hundred meters of, of uh, Tigon tubing through which you circulate cold water and you can control the amount of cooling that you have depending on your temperature. So um, the US spacesuits uh, come in two pieces. The lower part you get into in the mid deck and then you float into the airlock where the upper part of the spacesuit is hanging on the wall. This is looking up into the spacesuit. This is the umbilical which hooks up. That has your uh, your water and a, and a circulating air supply. These are the arms. This is the shoulder bearing, which allows you this sort of motion. The yellow material is the impermeable material, which holds the oxygen inside the spacesuit. It's a very tight fit, so you sort of squeeze and you push and you push, and it's a great feeling when you finally get your head out. Then uh, you put on the helmet and the gloves. And now it's interesting. Um, one of the, the medical hazards in uh, doing a spacewalk is decompression sickness, the bends. Uh, and the reason is, I said the spacesuit is filled with pure oxygen, and, and here's why. Uh, you can think of a spacesuit as an anthropomorphic balloon. If you've played with those long, thin balloons, you know, they, look, they use at parties, and if you try to bend it, it snaps back because as you bend it, you're compressing the gas. It's the same with a spacesuit. You, you bend your fingers, you bend your, the joints. You have to work, do thermodynamic work against the gas inside. Now, the spacesuit designers have done an excellent job at minimizing the volume change when you're moving around. But nevertheless, the higher the pressure, the more you have to work to bend the suit and to do useful work. So we want to run our spacesuits as, at, at as low a pressure as possible, and that's why we only use pure oxygen. We don't want to waste any pressure on nitrogen, which we don't need physiologically for short periods. You can't breathe pure oxygen forever, but we're only out there for eight hours or so. And, and uh, the problem is, if you go from one atmosphere to three-tenths of an atmosphere, which is what we run our spacesuits at, the nitrogen in your blood will bubble out and you'll get decompression sickness. So we actually have to breathe pure oxygen for about 40 minutes to allow enough nitrogen to come out of our blood and, and our body tissue. Walks. It's just an incredible view, very exciting, but uh, we have a lot of serious work to do. Uh, the way we operate, one of us stands on the arm. In this case, the first day it was me, and my colleague's story was free-floating. Uh, the first day, we actually, I, I said there were many other problems. We had to replace the gyroscopes. Four of the six had failed. Story actually had to, had to climb underneath. I would take the, the, uh, the wrench and, and uh, power wrench, unscrew the bolts. Story would remove the old 
uh, unit. I would hand him the new one, he'd hold it in place, I'd put the bolts back in. And you can see here, I'm actually helping him out. We have to be very careful, because again, we don't want to be the crew who broke something on the Hubble telescope. Um, and there you can see, actually putting away night to day. Uh, they rolled up like, like old-fashioned window shades, but the second one, as you can see, doesn't look very healthy. It wasn't rolling up properly, and the reason was that these, this stiffening rod had buckled because of thermal stress. Uh, so when Tom and Kathy were going out on date, which doesn't happen. Um, but they went on and, and installed two new solar arrays, uh, which uh, solved that problem. On the third day, we finally got to work uh, fixing the optics. So I'm getting ready now to attach a handhold to the old wide field planetary camera. Remember the picture in the water tank? It's a good feeling when you're doing something like this and it feels like, you know, I really know what I'm doing. I've done this before. Uh, we stowed the old uh, camera on the side, and here we're taking out the new one. Uh, the most critical part, the, the, that pick-off mirror, was protected with a uh, little device which we had to remove, being very careful not to misalign the, the mirror. Uh, we had gone through about 20 different things that could go wrong, but in fact, everything went perfect. And when that was installed, there was great jubilation on the part of the astronomers on the ground because they knew at least one of the repairs of the Hubble optics had now been installed and there were putting the old instrument to bed and getting, it was brought back to Earth and actually um, on display in the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. But we still had the other optics to uh, repair. Oh, uh, the other thing that happened though, uh, magnetometers, um, there were two simple magnetometers. Neither was supposed to fail. In fact, they both did. They were never designed to be replaced, so we couldn't remove them. We had to put new magnetometers on top of them and change the wiring around so that they used the old wiring. But that was done. So here is the, that big telephone booth size object, inside of which, in this container here, all of the, those little mirrors are, are all folded up because you can't install it when the mirrors are deployed. Notice Kathy can't see where she's going and it's a very tight clearance, which is why Tom is actually inside the telescope guiding it in. And again, all sorts of things had gone wrong in the simulations, but it, it actually went perfectly. So now all of the corrective optics had been installed. That's just an example of how we use those power tools. It really saves a tremendous amount of time, as well as wear and tear on your wrist, which is not so easy in a, in a spacesuit. Look at all the tools, though, hanging from Kathy's uh, chest on, on the tool carrier. And every single tool has to be tethered all the time. You don't want your tools going floating away. That's very bad form. Now, we do have to clean the spacesuits after each use and, you know, de disinfect them. Uh, nobody's in that suit, by the way. Um, yeah, astronauts are flexible, but not that flexible. And now the fifth and final uh, day, when we were replacing the magnetometers, I noticed that there was some paint chipping off, which they were afraid might contaminate the optics. So this was an unplanned task. We had to make special covers and now go up once again. And what a treat this was. I was free floating that day. You can see me moving around about 600 kilometers over the coast of Western Australia. It's just an extraordinary experience. You're floating up there. Uh, but everything worked right, and, and our last job was to help get the telescope ready for deployment. You can see the, uh, coming down here now, the, uh, the new solar array. <coughs> and that's the new, uh, when deploying it, you can see the stiffening rods now are covered with uh, kind of an aluminum foil to protect them from the thermal stress. So we had completed five of the most complex spacewalks that had ever been attempted. Many people thought it was actually too complicated, that NASA had bitten off more than it could chew, so to speak. But uh, we were 
justifiably uh, and I think understandably uh, incredibly happy that it had gone so well and uh, all that was left now was to deploy the telescope which was kind of the reverse of when we took it in. Uh, Claude uses the arm, reaches out, grabs the telescope, we release the latches, pick the telescope up, release it, and now being very careful with our rocket uh, exhaust, they have to use a special technique so that we don't plume the, uh, the solar arrays, and we gradually f uh, float away and uh, say our farewell to the Hubble telescope. Um, but I did manage uh, during the spacewalks to, uh, af to, to take a few pictures uh, right after we had installed the wide field camera, for instance. We had to wait five minutes while the ground checked out the connections. I asked uh, our arm operator to fly me out over the wings so I could take a picture and share with people what it really looks like when you're outside with a Hubble Space Telescope, which you can see over here. Uh, my colleague's story over here. This is the old wide field camera in storage before we put it back. Uh, the crew is up here in the front. By the way, the Earth is not really flat. This is a wide angle lens with, uh, and talking about interesting optical effects, I'll let you think about this one. This is the transparent Hubble telescope, right? You can see right through it to the Earth. I'll leave it as an exercise for the students. But just a glorious uh, experience is, uh, you know, obviously we were working pretty hard, but you have to keep a small part of your consciousness just to realize, oh my God, look where I am. And, you know, here we are sort of hanging out watching the sunset from Hubble. And this is what it looks like looking, I mean, Hubble is big. It's 15 meters from the top to the bottom. So uh, very impressive to work on. But, you know, far and away, it, it was that trip up to the top of the telescope where, uh, you know, suspended between heaven and earth, uh, just an experience which will be with me for the rest of my life. Not, however, a place if you suffer from vertigo, um, which some spacewalkers have reported. But in any case, uh, I will uh, just, uh, I, I mentioned before we, we did have two fairly serious problems in addition to the um, the, the problem with the solar array. The first uh, was with getting those doors closed. The second, I'll just uh, briefly describe because it was, it was really, uh, it was on our last day. Most of the uh, equipment on Hubble was very well designed for uh, astronauts in bulky gloves to work with. In other words, if, if you have to remove an instrument, you design it with a big bolt, one big bolt. You can put your, your power wrench on it and loosen that one bolt, take the whole thing out. The electronics to control the solar arrays, people felt, well, we had two of them. They're very reliable. They'll never fail. They didn't design them for EVA <laughs> removal. Well, one of them failed. And so what happened? They asked us to replace it. Oh, there were eight connectors on this. I don't know how many of you remember the old SCSI connectors with the two millimeter screws. Imagine working with these little two millimeter screws with big space gloves and the screws, some of them got loose and started to float around. We, we would put them in our trash bag, uh, but as more and more screws got in the trash bag, when you open the trash bag to put another screw, and of course they're all floating around and you have a diffusion process and some of the screws come out Story, who was attached to the arm that day, reached for one, didn't quite get it, and the screw started floating away down towards the cargo bay, which you don't want extra stuff floating around. It might get in a piece of critical equipment, stop us from closing the doors. That would be a bad day. Well, I, I could move around, so um, you know I held on, and I, I reached out to get the screw, but it was just a little bit uh, too far away. So Claude operating the arm said, well, just hang on, Jeff, I'll, I'll move the arm. It turned out that the speed at which the arm was moving was the same speed at which the screw was moving. And so, you know, I was holding on and the screw was just about six inches too far away. And here's where the training really comes in handy because our pilot, who was the backup arm operator, realized that 
the arm at the, that time was programmed that it had a load on it. Whenever the arm has a load on it, whether it's a satellite or a person, its top speed is slowed down. So he quickly went over to the computer, did a, changed the program around and told it that it was unloaded. All of a sudden it speeded up and I was able to grab the screw and that was the great screw chase and it was successful. <laughs> so, uh, that was the Hubble telescope uh, just before we released it. And as I said, we were extremely happy that we had successfully completed everything that had been asked of us. But there's still the question, will the corrective optics work? Again, this is not a suspense story, okay? You know that it did, but we didn't at the time. And they couldn't turn on the instrumentation for a couple of weeks because you have to wait for outgassing. Otherwise, when you apply high, high voltage, you'll get sparking, you'll mess up your electronics. So I always remember that night, it was New Year's Eve, uh, we had had a party, I was cleaning up, it was about one o'clock in the morning, the phone rang, it was an astronomer friend from the Hubble Space Telescope Science Institute. And you know, Happy New Year, Happy New Year. Jeff, do you have any champagne handy? Well, yeah, we still had a half bottle in the refrigerator. Pour yourself a glass. I'm not supposed to tell you anything because they're gonna have a big press conference in a couple of days and uh, but we figured somebody on the crew should know that we got the first pictures back and it worked. As I say, you all... This was 20 years ago, <laughs> but I'm glad you're still happy about it. We certainly were. And of course, the rest was history because you know, as you all know, Hubble has gone on to rewrite astronomy books several times over. I mean, the, 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 the birth of stars, this iconic pillars of creation, which I still get goosebumps looking at. Um, the death of stars, these incredible planetary nebulae as the stars throw off their atmosphere in these unbelievable patterns. I mean, it's like psychedelic art, but, but that's the universe that we live in. I mean, it's real. And the amazing thing that Hubble, that the project has done is, is these pictures are all available, anybody, all over the world. Um, so um, I'm, I'm coming to the end. I, and, and of course, the critical thing now about Hubble is, is the incredible scientific discoveries that have been made. And that would be a whole, not, well, not even an evening's talk. I mean, there are week-long symposiums about the results from Hubble. But, I can't leave without just talking about one, and, and if I had to choose the, you know, the one incredible breakthrough that Hubble has made, and there have been many, but it was the deep field. Um, the second director of the Telescope Institute, Bob Williams, who's a friend, told me when he was a kid, he, he would continually get telescopes for his birthdays, and every time he got a new telescope, he would go out into his backyard and he'd hook up a camera and he just wanted to see what can the telescope do. And so he, now he's the boss of the greatest telescope in the world. And as director, he has 10 days of time at his disposal, the so-called director's discretionary time, not subject to peer review. And he just wanted to see what Hubble could do. No peer review panel would have ever dedicated 10 days of Hubble time just to point at a tiny portion of the sky in which other telescopes thought was empty. And yet, as uh, hopefully all of you know, thousands of galaxies there. I mean, it, it increased by orders of magnitude our knowledge of, of how many galaxies there are in the universe. And of course, also, the, what we found out is the older the galaxies are, the less and less regular they are compared to the modern spiral and elliptical galaxies we see. But it's gone further than that. Um, astronomers, even 50 years ago, recognized that there's more matter around galaxies than we can account for by the stars, so-called dark matter. But Hubble was able to get the most precise measure of this that had ever been taken using the gravitational light deflection predicted by Einstein's general theory where you look at an object behind this galactic cluster 
and that's one single galaxy which has been deformed by this Einstein ring effect. And by studying that, you can measure very accurately the distribution and amount of dark matter, which it turns out is about four times as much dark matter as there is regular matter. So we don't know what dark matter is, but at least we know where it is and how it's distributed. But it gets even better than that. I sound like a television commercial and <laughs> something even better. Um, one of probably the most important task that was set up for the observing program of the Hubble telescope was to determine the Hubble constant and the acceleration constant. Edwin Hubble, early in the 20th century, realized that a lot of those fuzzy things up there were what he called island universes, galaxies. He measured both their distance and the speed with which they're moving away or towards us. And of course, as, as hopefully all of you know, most galaxies seem to be moving away from us. And Hubble found that the farther away they are, the faster they're moving. That's the redshift. And this suggested the model of a continually expanding universe. And if you run the clock backwards, of course, you get the Big Bang and the universe is expanding and of course everybody knew absolutely knew that because of all the mass in the universe and the gravity of that mass this expansion would be slowing down but how much it would be slowing down we weren't able to measure because to really measure it accurately you have to be able to look at galaxies really really far away which Hubble could finally do so two independent teams set out to determine the rate at which this expansion was slowing down, and again, hopefully you all know the answer, is much to everybody's total astonishment, the expansion is not slowing down, it's accelerating due to a force which has been called dark energy, and it's always nice to give something a name because it makes it sound like you know what you're talking about, but in fact, we don't have a clue what dark energy is, but using some other satellite data. Um, and again, hopefully you, you, you've seen this, but uh, uh, you, know, you, you can't emphasize this enough, the incredible transformation in our knowledge of what our universe is made of. The dark matter is almost a quarter of our universe. We, don't, we know where it is, we don't know what it is. Dark energy, almost three quarters of the content of the universe, and we don't have a clue. So students, I'm sorry to tell you this, but everything that you have learned about physics and chemistry and biology only applies to about 4% of the universe that we live in. That's not to say you shouldn't study hard, but still. <laughs> How we're gonna figure all this out, and uh, this is just what I'm gonna end with, is looking ahead to what uh, we're all looking forward to the launch, hopefully two years from now, of the Webb Space Telescope. And just as Hubble was the great application of the telescope technology of the mid 20th century towards the end of the 20th century astronomers started making uh, multi-mirror telescopes and this technology is now being put into space with the Webb telescope the mirrors are, are ready uh, and of course the incredible thing is the scale of this telescope which is I mean you can see here this is a full-scale mock-up much, much too big to put under the launch shroud of any rocket. So the whole thing has to be folded up. And of course, it's not going to be orbiting the Earth. It's going to be located a million miles on the anti-sun direction at the second Lagrange point. And there's going to be a lot of people very nervous when it finally gets out there and all starts to deploy because we can't go out there and fix it. Um, but we did fix Hubble. And uh, Hubble is still in great shape. If I had uh, another hour, I could talk to you about the other four servicing missions because uh, they really did fulfill the dream. And that's what's kept Hubble at the peak of scientific uh, usefulness. Uh, you know, most uh, space experiments, they go through an initial period of discovery and eventually the new discoveries level off because you reach the, the limit of their technology. Whereas with Hubble, every time we had a servicing mission, we had a new telescope. So we've now had five Hubble telescopes and the latest, the, the final servicing mission in 2009 left Hubble as good as new. It's in great shape. 
hopefully it, uh, it'll still be with us when web is launched and after that, who knows? Um, there's still about 10 times more demand to use Hubble than there is time, so I think there's a lot to be done. Uh, as for me, um, it won't be me who uh, goes up there uh, if we have to do any more work. And in fact, now that the shuttle has been retired, Hubble is basically on its own. But, uh, but it's been a great story and uh, an incredible instrument. I've been extremely fortunate to have been able to play my part in it. And, uh, you know, it's always a pleasure to talk about it. I hope you gather that I, I still get excited when I tell the story because it sort of brings it back and, uh, and it's a delight to share it with all of you. So uh, I hope this has showed you maybe some things you haven't known about Hubble and, and gotten you all excited about it all over again. Thank you. We, um, we have the auditorium for about another 15 minutes, and I'd be delighted to answer questions if some of you have them. Uh, some of our uh, TAs have microphones, and uh, right, first question. Professor Hoffman, thank you very much for coming. It was a really an inspirational speech. Thank you. I'm curious, as a graduate of the Astronaut Corps, what you see as the role of the Astronaut Corps in the age of commercial space exploration and interplanetary travel as reality television? Oh, reality television, I'm not gonna go there, but as far as uh, interplanetary travel, let me just confine this to, to Mars, okay? Because the, uh, the exploration of Mars is, is one of NASA's great goals, the search for life. Um, I'm actually fortunate to be working now, probably one of the last of my space projects, uh, is an experiment which will go to Mars for reputation discovering Precambrian life in stromatolites in Australia. And she said, you know, there, there was a whole strata, hundreds of meters wide, uh, that, and she had to look through the entire thing, and she found like three separated examples of these Precambrian fossils. No way would a robotic detector have found those, possibly if they had gotten incredibly lucky. Um, and that's why the, the chief scientist at NASA has, has said that almost certainly, uh, if we do have a hope of finding life or pre-existing life or current life, I mean, it's almost surely microscopic and almost surely it will have to be done by people there. I mean, there's just things that, that people can, can do and see which we're not going to get with our robots. As far as the whole commercial uh, developments, that's, that's a whole other topic in itself. But I find it one of the most exciting things that's going on is, is I mean, uh, the, the public-private partnership. We've done it yet, and we'll just have to see how it works out. Thanks again for your presentation. It was uh, one of the best I've attended. The plunge point is, is, a, is kind of, but it's a million miles away. My question is, uh, since it's not going to be uh, very close to us, do you think web, okay? If, God forbid, I'm, you know, there's probably a prayer somewhere for how to open up a telescope when you get into space. There's prayers for everything else, right? But uh, if for some reason that doesn't work and there's a serious problem, you can be sure that uh, we'll try to figure out something. But right now, we don't have the capability of sending people a million miles away from the Earth. So I, I, I really, you know, I can't answer the question. Uh, and I hope it's a question that never has to be answered. I think it was purposely put there to from thinking about 
No, it was not put, I mean, this is Ofer is making a little joke about, we put it there because actually uh, the way Hubble was designed, uh, it, it, it did cost a lot more to make it serviceable. Uh, and they maybe could have said, well, we just, we just don't want to go there. But of course, the thing about Webb, and, and I'll just uh, elaborate a little bit, in order to look at really far away galaxies, and we want Webb to be able to see galaxies even further away and fainter than Hubble is capable of detecting, um, but because of the expansion of the universe, they're redshifted, so even the ultraviolet light that was emitted from those galaxies has now been shifted into the infrared, so the Webb telescope is basically an infrared telescope, which means Thermally, it has to be very stable. Hubble's going from night to day to night to day, not a place for a delicate uh, infrared telescope. Webb has to be cooled. Uh, the part on the top of the sunshades has to be cooled to 40 degrees Kelvin, and that's why it's put at a stable point so far away. Uh, just a There's a lot of talk about should there be end-to-end -end testing. Of course, to do an end-to-end -end test of something like Hubble is extremely expensive. Uh, and money was short, the schedule was tight. But also, you have to remember, when people were thinking about doing an end-to-end -end test, nobody was thinking about catching a gross error like actually happened. They were really thinking about, you know, maybe there were little small things. and. One of the problems in doing a test where you have a, a very uh, delicate mirror like that is when you do the test in gravity, if you find some problem with the shape of the mirror, you always have the question how much of that is due to the deformation of gravity. And so there were a lot of ways that people were able to convince themselves that we didn't need to do an end-to-end -end test. However, after Hubble, we had other great observatories, the Chandra X-ray Observatory, the Spitzer Infrared Observatory. They had end-to-end -end tests. We, we learned the lesson. Well, there's lots of mistakes to be made, and hopefully we learn the mistakes. Hopefully with Hubble, we were able to fix it. Hello, uh, I'm an astronomer, and I know that you started as a high-energy astrophysicist. So I'm curious to know if this Hubble experience has affected your research interest. Well, uh, first of all, uh, you're right. I, I didn't, in, in introducing myself, I didn't mention that before I was selected as an astronaut, I was an astronomer. Um, and so one of the great thrills of my life, both as an astronomer and an astronaut, to put my two hands on the Hubble Space Telescope was unforgettable. Um, however, I have to say that after spending, I spent 25 years at NASA during which I didn't do any astronomy research. So when I was ready to go back to university life, I couldn't actually present myself as an up-to-date astronomer. On the other hand, I had learned a lot about engineering. I had spent a lot of time working with engineers, and so that's why I'm now a professor in the aeronautics and astronautics engineering, part of the engineering school at MIT. In my heart, I still love astronomy, but that's not my research anymore. I think there was a question up here. <clears throat> Hi, so my question was about um, the repairs you did on the modules mm -hmm. that were designed to be replaced. Do you think... Um, an station ...was the fifth and final Hubble servicing mission, um, and Sean O'Keefe, then the head of NASA, decreed that this was too dangerous, and so we would not service. Hubble would be left to die. Um, the... NASA actually had to develop many uh, ways of meeting some of the problems that you would have to be able to take care of if we launch not to the space station. I don't have time to go into all of those. We had to have a way of repairing tiles. We had to have a way of inspecting the tiles and 
uh, when, when the fifth servicing mission actually went into space, there was another shuttle on the launch pad ready to go for a rescue. So we did a lot to, to make it safe to do that fifth and final servicing mission in 2009, without which, I mean, Hubble's batteries were dying. Uh, we wouldn't have Hubble around today. Um, hello, my name is Naum. Um, Jeffrey, uh, that's, it's very, extremely impressive and exciting what you've done. And I, I, even, I have one too. Yeah, I, I can see. And I don't even know how to articulate this question, but I'll try my best. Um, well, you've been in five missions. Um, you, you, as you said, you, you work with your hands in one of the greatest uh, machines uh, that we have built that has given mm. us uh, a, a beautiful and great insight into our universe. And now a few years have passed since, since that moment. And I guess my question is uh, an ontological one, and that is what has been your cognitive shift um, after this experience, now that you see it with a distance, like personally and philosophically, what is different about you? Oh, you know, when people ask, how have you changed personally, that's a very hard question for a person to answer about themselves. Um, I mean, my friends will tell you I'm just as stubborn as I ever was and have same, some of the same personality quirks. Um, my wife might